Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to another episode in our Matthew study. We're starting to work on what they call the Sermon on the Mount, which is probably the longest of the sermons recorded in the Gospels. I'm going to call this the introduction because we're just going to talk a little bit about why why the Sermon on the Mount was pivotal in uh, Jesus' ministry. And uh, go over a few things about it, and, and actually, it's, it's listed one other place in Luke, much shorter version. So, a lot of the uh, commentators believe that this particular sermon was a basic one that Jesus used on many occasions. So we see it. The one in in, uh, in Luke is slightly different. There's argument back and forth whether they're the same one or not. But Matthew records the entire one, and it takes up three chapters. So uh, it's going to be, uh, we'll kind of take a look at each aspect and we'll touch a little bit on it today. Uh, but the overall reason that uh, Jesus came and what his basic message was too is kind of spread out in this in this particular sermon. Uh, so dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for, your, for this, the deliverance of this sermon. And Lord, uh, I want to give it the honor and glory that it deserves, uh, being it's your words. And I want to give, be faithful to it. So help me, Lord. Help me to be honest uh, in what, I, uh, what I'm delivering and in respect to your word. And I give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I think the big thing with this is that the fact that uh, we, can, we can really see what Jesus thinks about when he's talking about uh, the future. Uh, so this is a little prophetic, uh, prophetic also in as much that his whole emphasis during his time here was to bring bring forth the kingdom, a period of time after the current age where Satan is in control to a new kingdom that he is going to bring and rule over, and that's in the future. So his whole emphasis in his first coming was, besides dying on the cross to pay for our, the, for our sins, was also to introduce people to what the future is going to hold and you can see this in the in the uh, in this sermon here uh, as we uh, as we take a look at it so it might give us a little insight as to what life will be like under king jesus too so so i'm just going to reference a few things that uh out of different chapters in the bible to try to uh, uh show uh particularly the emphasis he was trying to show through these through this sermon. Again, I think he, he repeated this sermon or parts of it on multiple occasions, and we got at least two places in the Bible where we see this uh, in Matthew and in Luke. So I'm actually going to read through the Luke account today because it's only 29 verses, and uh, uh, and we'll actually analyze the Matthew. Like here's an overview, and then we'll actually spend the next uh, most of next week. Uh, actually looking at the actual, it may take a couple of weeks of our Matthew study to actually go through all the uh, Sermon on the Mount that's recorded in Matthew. So let's start off. And I thought since we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount that we would have the location And it's the background picture you see uh, that I've been using, except that uh, I have that uh, display of the genealogy above it. But most of you believe is in this general area uh, is where the sermon, probably on this hillside here, because it's an actual amphitheater type of effect, either here or over in here. Uh, this is the general area of Copernicum and uh, uh, Bethesda and that general area uh, where Jesus spent a lot of his time. Uh, so and it sounds like because it was on a, a mount, they probably were speaking to quite a few people and using a natural amphitheater would be really easy to speak to a, a large group of people. Here's another view uh, that kind of shows the uh, same idea. Uh, this is that same valley I was, I was showing you for, uh, close up, uh, but this general area through here also is a, a since it does say Sermon on the Mount, it could actually be up top, too. Uh, but most likely, uh, using the natural effect of an amphitheater uh, would work well if there was a lot of people. There's still controversy over exactly if there was a lot of people or not. So 
So here we have one of the, of the one of the longest of Jesus' most likely sermons in print, and probably given on many occasions that we will see, based on his beginning of his ministry, was to preach. So let's get, this, get an introduction here in Matthew 5, uh, verses 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came, came unto him. Well, disciples can be, it could be the twelve, uh, or it could be more than 12, because we know that people followed him uh, in his ministry. He selected 12 to, to further the ministry, but plenty of people followed him. At some point, some people believe there might have been as close to 200 people following him on a regular basis. So when he says disciples, it could be more than the 12. It says when he was set, it was, it was quite common uh, that when a rabbi was speaking, that he would sit and people would formulate around him and stand and listen. Uh, and that was, that, that was classic Jewish uh, etiquette, that when, they, when a rabbi would be the one sitting, and it's funny how in church uh, most of the congregation is sitting, but the one preaching is actually standing. That wasn't the way with Jesus. Uh, so, so this location on top of the hill might have been more, might be a more obvious area, uh, a big open area where he would be able to sit down and the people surround him. <laughs> Hard to say. It could have been halfway up this alley. Uh, and again, natural amphitheaters uh, help out a lot too. And he opened his mouth and taught them. So that's why I'm going to stop there for a second. So based on his beginning of his ministry was to preach, as we read prior in Matthew 4, 17. From the time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That kingdom of heaven is the, is the whole emphasis I'm kind, of, I'm kind of gearing my thoughts on, is that that's what Jesus was preaching about, is that, that kingdom. You remember the, uh, remember the prayer, uh, the famous prayer, the example for us on how to pray. Part of it says, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the idea is this kingdom coming to earth. It's already in heaven. Also in Mark 1, 14 and 15. Now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So that's another reason they believe this is the area because again, like I mentioned, Copernicum, this is the Sea of Galilee, you see out here. And this is Copernicum area. So uh, most likely this sermon happened in this general area. This is based on Isaiah 61.1, uh, which is the prophecy of this going to be, of, of this happening. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because of the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to reclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. We're going to see this during this sermon. He's actually going to use some of these same terms. So this is only mentioned one little place, and that's in Luke 6. 20 through 20, uh, 49. I'm going to read that in, uh, towards the end of this talk, which we will refer to as we go along. But many commentators debate who the audience was, just the 12 disciples or many disciples who were also following him. We see in verse 1, as I uh, go back to that for a second, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was set, the disciples came unto him. So, uh, Multitudes, of course, doesn't tell us how many, but it does seem to indicate a large number of people. And also in Matthew 8, 1, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. So we get the idea that there were people following him all the time. And also Matthew 17, 1, and after six days, Jesus taken Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringing them up to a high mountain apart. And jumping down to verse 14. And when they were coming to the multitude, they came to him a certain man kneeling down to him. And so again, another indication that uh, there was quite a multitude following him on a regular basis. The question is, when he went up these mountains, except for except for in 17.1, did the multitude follow him up the mountain? Or maybe he just went higher to be heard by so many. Another one of these truths we may discover when we get to actually uh, uh, in his presence I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions and answers, periods. Uh, I'm sure that uh, I'm not the only one that's curious about things when it comes to the Lord, as uh, probably many people do. They'll have plenty of questions. 
Now, one of the truths we may discover when we meet him in person, we do believe that he did position himself at times to be heard by a multitude, like when we got into the boat in our last session. Remember, he got into the boat so he could go out into the water a little bit and be able to talk to everybody. That might have been right in his general area uh, over here. Uh, maybe the people were on the shore in an actual amphitheater like this. And if, you, if you've ever been in a stadium, uh, you see those stadiums where the speaker would be down in like uh, the cone area, and above them will be all the seats where people are listening. That's an actual amphitheater. And so the same idea here. As it, uh, I'm sure Jesus used the same things. So, and he opened his mouth. So we saw that in verse 1. Having announced the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the king in Matthew, in Matthew 5, chapter 5 through 7, declares the principles of the kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount has a twofold application. First of all, literally to the kingdom. In this sense, it gives a divine constitution for the righteous government of the earth. Whenever the kingdom of heaven is established on earth, it will be according to that constitution, which may be regarded as an explanation of the word righteousness as used by the prophets in describing the kingdom. Here's a few examples in Isaiah 11, 4 and 5. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove equality for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And the righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Also Isaiah 32.1. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. Daniel 9.24. Seventy weeks are determined upon the people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. In this sense, the Sermon on the Mount is pure law and transfers the offense from the overt act to the motive. So I just pick a few here in Matthew 5, 21 and 22. As some examples, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry when his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of counsel, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Also in verse 27 and 28, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery in her heart already, uh, committed adultery with her already in his heart. So here lies the deep reason why the Jews rejected the kingdom. Uh, they had reduced righteousness to mere ceremonialism and the Old Testament idea of the kingdom to a mere affair of outward splendor and power. They were never rebuked for expecting a visible and powerful kingdom, but the words of the prophets should have prepared them to expect also that only the poor in spirit and meek could share in it. Isaiah 11.4 speaks to this. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equality for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So the 72nd Psalm actually is one of those Psalms that uh, most of the most people believe is what the Pharisees at that time kind of universally used as a description of the kingdom. For this reason, the Sermon on the Mount in its primary application gives neither the privilege nor the duty of the church. These are found in the epistles. Under the law of the kingdom, for example, no one may hope for forgiveness who has not first been forgiven. Matthew 6, 12 speaks to this. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 6, 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 15. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So under grace, the Christian is exhorted to forgive because he has already forgiven. Paul in Ephesians 4, 30-32 speaks to this too. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. 
And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So, but there is a moral, uh, uh, there is also a beautiful moral application to the Christian. It always reminds true, it remains true, that the poor in spirit, rather than the proud, are blessed. And those who mourn because of their sins, and who are meek in their consciousness of them, will hunger and thirst after righteousness, and hungering will be fulfilled. The merciful are blessed, the pure in heart do see God. These principles fundamentally re uh, reappear in the teaching of the epistles. So saying the beautiful character, unattainable by effort, is wrought in the believer by the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 speak to this. But the fool of the Spirit is love, I mean, the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So, Let's read through the Luke version and get an overview. It's in Luke 6, 20 through 29, which is much shorter. So as we mentioned, the Matthew version may have been the basic message that Jesus used on many occasions. We know that the uh, the other large teachings he did were long also, like the feeding of the 4,000 and 5,000. Those went on for days, so over multiple days. What's important is that this may give us an insight to what life will be like during the kingdom age. We all would like to know what being under perfect rule of King Jesus will be like. I know I love the dream of our permanent home one day. So the, the, the first thing you're going to see in both of these accounts is what they call the B attitudes, which we see in both of them. So let me read through this, uh, and then, I'll, then we'll comment on a few things uh, that I read. Uh, then we'll, then we'll comment on the Beatitudes if we get to those today, depending on time. So Luke 6, 20 through 49. I'm just going to read through it and give, you, give, give us a little taste of uh, what the whole three chapters is going to be like when we get into the actual uh, Sermon on the Mount. He lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be, poor, be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil, for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in that like manner did the fathers unto the prophets. Be it woe unto you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. That's basically, the, I like that section, because it's basically saying that if you try to achieve these kind of things, and these things are the what's important to you now, then you're going to suffer for it later. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to, their, to the false prophets. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them that which hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them that which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away the cloak, forbid not to take the coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what, thank, what thanks have ye? For sinners also love those who, that love them. And if ye do good to them which be good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them who have hope to receive, what thank ye have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much gain. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. 
Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. Shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure that ye met with all, it shall be measured to you again. And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Either how cast thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his fruit, for his own fruit. For of thorns men do gather figs, nor of bramble bush gather they grapes. And good men out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and evil men out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. And why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my savings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, Amelia fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So that's the Luke version of this particular sermon. I just pointed out a couple of things. Uh, we're also going to move in and, and start reading the actual uh, sermon. The first part of the Sermon on the Mount, which is the, what they call the Beatitudes. So let's look at those. And uh, we can start taking these apart and seeing what they actually are speaking. We, we mentioned them earlier in the Luke account. This is the Matthew version. But I'm going to comment on a few of the verses. <clears throat> blessed are the poor in heart, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So blessed, well, blessed is used a lot in here. So let's take a look at the, some other places blessed is used to kind of get an idea of what it means. We see it in the absolute first psalm, Psalm 1-1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Jump into Psalm 32, 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputeth no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. And jump into Psalm 119. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that speak him with the whole heart. <coughs> it also makes blessed are those that are poor in spirit. And I think that's basically saying is that you realize that we are sinners, that we, we don't deserve what the Lord is doing for us. That's being uh, being blessed for those who are poor in spirit. Continuing on in Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. So if you desire to actually be involved with the Lord and to be uh, under his righteousness, that's the kind of hunger that we're talking about here. For they shall be filled. Verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, that is our word again. Uh, we spoke of yesterday, but here is a parable to help us. I'll read one parable of, of a few Jesus spoke to in Matthew 13. If you get a chance, and we'll get to it when we get to Matthew 13, of course. 
I'm going to read the first one. Uh, it's in verses 1 through 23. Now, give us an idea of what this kingdom of heaven is talking about through this parable. So jump into chapter 13. The same day when Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and a great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. You kind of envision that right on our picture. It might have happened right, right around here somewhere. And he spoke many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. That happens every year when I plant grass, but I know what that means. Some fell upon the stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more in abundance. But whosoever hath not, for him shall be taken away, even that that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they, they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Elijah, uh, which said, By hearing you shall hear, and, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. For well, these people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes have been have been closed, at least at any time they should see with their ear eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I shall heal them. And I think basically what he's basically saying here, and I just want to kind of interject this uh, thought process, is that once you become a child of God, and you, you are following the Lord like these disciples are, you're going to fully understand him. But until you do that, you will not have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in you. So a lot of this stuff will not make sense to you. Continuing here in verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them. To hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. <clears throat> When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and attacketh the way that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. <clears throat> but he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and, and announced with joy, receiveth it. Yet he hath not, he hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he become unfruitful. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So that's uh, that's a good example of uh, of how Jesus was bringing the kingdom of heaven and trying to show uh, what the kingdom of heaven was going to be like. So going back to uh, Matthew five uh, eleven and twelve, let's just finish up this particular section on the Beatitudes. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So that ends the Beatitudes section, and we'll continue on. We got. <clears throat> I didn't want to go too deeply this week, so next week we'll actually get into it uh, next Thursday and Friday. Uh, and continue with this particular lesson. But just a few things to leave you with about rewards. 
Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So what can we expect for these rewards? And that's actually mentioned during this period. I just mention it now. It's in Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Take heed that you do not you do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Arms is talking about uh, so, uh, basically tithing, uh, giving money to the ministry. Therefore, when thou dost thou arms, do it not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But... But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. <clears throat> that thine eyes may be in secret, and Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. <clears throat> also mentions it in Dan 12, verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Also, 1 Corinthians 3, 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. <clears throat> so these are those crowns we talk about when we get into Revelations. Uh, those are the those are the rewards for faithful service to the Lord. It's not. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has nothing to do with uh, gaining salvation. Salvation is a free gift by the Lord, and there's nothing you can do uh, to to bring it upon without it, without the Lord's. Uh, without reaching out to the Lord himself uh, to receive uh, that gift. Uh, there's nothing you can do to try to obtain it for yourself without the Lord. So stop there for today, and uh, we'll head back in this next week when we get back into Matthew. Uh, great section. We'll get to know the Lord. If you want to read ahead, again, the uh, Sermon on the Mount is chapters 5, 6, and 7. Uh, if you want to read ahead and see uh, and get an idea for next week. Of course, at the beginning of the week, we'll be back in Numbers. And uh, I love doing this split study because it uh, it gives us a perspective from uh, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is actually looking forward to Jesus Christ coming to earth. And the New Testament mostly is looking back at Jesus Christ and what he did when he did come to the earth. So it's a... Uh, the center of the entire Bible is Jesus, uh, and that's something that we all should pay attention to, and we should study the whole Bible. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much, Lord, for the, for these for these wise words that you've given us to help us to understand how it is we should live today and to be in uh, service to you, Lord. And we thank you and we praise you so much. And help us to understand your word in a mighty and powerful way. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Okay. So you guys have a great weekend. And we will talk again next week. And if you're in the Florence area, I hope to see you on Sunday at the Fairhaven Baptist Church. So uh, have a good weekend. And uh, we'll talk later. <laughs>